Let's pray.
If you would, please take your Bible this morning and open up to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Something we need to realize in the church today is that our Christian walk is not about rituals. It's really not even about religion. I mean, we, we have this idea in society that Christianity is a religion, and it's not. It's, it's about a relationship. It's about a relationship with a Savior who came and, and lived and died and was buried and was rose again. It's about God's love towards humanity. But, but the church today has made it anything but that in many ways. We've made it about entertainment. Uh, we've made it about rituals and do's and don'ts. And we've made it about our Bible translations and about the hymn book we sing from and and all these different things, and we made it about how we dress and what we look like, and, 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 all, and, and you know, the reality of it is, it's not about that. It's about Jesus Christ and Him crucified and risen. Amen. I mean, Paul came when he Paul came and preached. He said, "I come to you not knowing anything and not teaching anything, but Jesus Christ and Him crucified." And through the years, I mean, I've been pastoring now for about 14 years, and I don't know how many people have come to me through the years at different intervals and said, Preacher, we don't need them in our church because they don't act like us. Or, Preacher, we don't need that person to come to our church because they've got a checkered past. Or, or Preacher, we don't need that person to come to our church because they won't fit in or they look different or they, they smell different or they act different. In the real, and, and I just want to look at them and say, who were you before Jesus got a hold of you? And who are you now outside of Jesus? Because none of us are any better than anybody else. And none of us have perfected our maturity and relationship with the Lord. That each one of us are on different planes of faith. And each one of us are growing together. And I think if we as a church, and we as the church of God today, would get away from our rituals and get away from our do's and don'ts and just... Talk about Jesus and His love and His forgiveness. And yeah, we have this idea of things that we don't need to do and things that are acceptable and not acceptable. But I firmly believe if you get some, if somebody embraces Jesus and God reveals Himself and they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they're, they're going to stop doing those things they're not supposed to do. Amen? You won't have to tell them what's wrong. They're going to know what's wrong. And so our text today, we find this same problem. Jesus dealing with the depravity of the man in the crowds and the Pharisees wanting to deal with the law on the Sabbath. And Jesus saying, it's not about that. It's about what I'm here for. And so Mark chapter 2 and verses 23. I'm going to read verse through 28, but we're going to cover through chapter 3 and verse 6 today. But Matthew, Mark, I mean Mark, sorry, Mark chapter 2 and verse 23 through 28. If you're there, say amen. amen. Mark chapter 2, it says, It came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day. And his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of the corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have you never read what David did when he had need and was hungered? And he that were with him, and how he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not loveful to eat, but for the priests, and gave also to them which were with him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son, the son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. Lord, we seek you today. We seek you this morning and ask, Father God, that you would speak to us. That you would open our eyes and open our heart to your truth, Father God. That we would realize our need for your love and your grace and your mercy. And God, the, the, that we, in return, should reciprocate that not only to you but others. And that God, we as a church should embrace your love and your grace. And extend that to others, Lord. God, surely that we know that there's things to do and not do. 
But God, our focus shouldn't be on the do's and don'ts. It should be about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. God, it was made clear in Sunday school today that we can turn heads, but you're the only one that can turn hearts. And so, God, we ask that. We ask, Father God, that if there's anyone here this morning that does not know your son Jesus, that before this morning is over, Father God, they'll walk this aisle and say, I need Jesus. That, Lord, they'll come to know what it's like to no longer have religion, but have a relationship. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Don't let it be I that speak, but you that speak through me. Amen. Amen. As we continue to look at our text before us, as we continue this series, we find a problem with focus. And that's really been a, a theme that has went on throughout this book is a difference of the focus of Jesus between the fo- His focus and the focus of the disciples and the, the focus of the Pharisees that He's always got a different focus than they do. And it says in verse 23 through 26, as we just read, it begins that the Pharisees were focused on the law. They were more concerned about the do's and the don'ts. They were more concerned about the tradition that was. And it said, The Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day which is not lawful? And we find there that as Jesus and his disciples were coming through, they start plucking this corn. They're hungry. They've been doing this for days and they've been traveling, so they start plucking this corn off. And the Pharisees come up and say, Look, what are they doing? They shouldn't be doing this. We have many in the church today that look at that same thing. We don't look at the need that's going on right there. We don't look at the fact that people are hungry. We don't look at the people, the fact that people are starving. We don't look at the people that people are hurting and depressed and need somebody to speak Jesus into them to, to love on them and encourage them and, uh, and give them some kind of hope. You know, we need to realize that our words are powerful. Amen? That they do something, people. And, and, and how we respond and how we act could affect somebody for eternity. It could literally turn them into, God, turn them into, look, into searching for something more than what they've got and looking to the place, looking to Jesus who has that. Or our words can turn them completely off from God and turn them away from God. And so the Pharisees were more concerned about this law and the do's and don'ts. But Christ was focused on the need. Listen to how He responds to them in 25 and 26. It says, And He said unto them, Have you never read that David, when he had need and was hungry, that he, he, that he that were with him, that he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar, the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat but for the priest, and gave also them which were with him? He said, you know what, at some point you've got to look beyond rituals. You've got to look beyond the do's and the don'ts. You've got to look beyond all the bureaucracy and all the politics. And you've got to look beyond all those man-made things and just start focusing on what people need. And what people need is Jesus. That They need the Word of God, yes, but it's not based on translation. They need Jesus. It doesn't matter if they're hearing it from the New American Standard, or the King James, or the ESV, or the Holman Christian Standard. What matters is they're hearing hearing Jesus Christ and the Word of God. It doesn't matter whether they're singing from a Baptist hymnal, a heavenly highway, or praise and worship. What matters is we're praising God and they're hearing songs that uplift God. And we get into all this idea, well, they got to be dressed a certain way and we got to have the right clothes and we got to have the right outfits. And I, you know what? You can dress me up and you can sit there and you can put me in a suit and I can shave and I can get all dressed and nice and underneath all the suit, underneath the tie, the dress shirt and the pants and the dress slacks and the shaven face and the clean cut hair, I'm still Charles McKendry. It doesn't matter if I'm in a suit or shorts and a t-shirt. It doesn't matter. I'm still the same person. And you can try to clean somebody up. You can try to make them look nice and neat. And you can try to make them get the mold of whatever Christian idea that you have. And the reality of it is, until they get Jesus, all it is is makeup and cover up. And Jesus was more concerned about what people were needing. In this case, him and his disciples were hungry. We had a lot of hungry people out there, and I'm not talking about physically hungry. I'm talking about spiritually hungry. We need to realize the disciples, according to the law, and according to what the Word of God says, they weren't even sinning. 
they weren't messing up. Because according to Deuteronomy chapter 23 through 25, it gave them permission to pluck corn by the hand. As long as it was not harvest, they couldn't harvest it with the sickle. But according to the word of God, they could walk up, they could go to the corn cob, and they could pull it off, pull off that single ear on that and work on it. That was according to the word of God. So what were the Pharisees talking about? What were the Pharisees saying that they're sinning, that this is against the law? I'll tell you what was causing them to be working according to the Pharisees' interpretation of the Old Testament was a rabbinic addition to the law. Because the rabbis and the Pharisees started adding more to the Word of God than what was actually there. You know how many people in the church today are getting ran off from the church because people start putting their own ideas into the Word of God? They start putting their own rules into the Word of God and their own ideas into worship and their own ideas into a relationship. And so, well, you know, I understand that's what the Bible says, preacher, but I look at it this way. I don't care how you look at it. What I care about is thus saith the Lord. Amen? It doesn't matter about my interpretation. It doesn't matter about your interpretation. It matters about the Word of God. Now, some people can get offended by that comment, I don't care. I got offended by it. I was at Williams Baptist College and, and I was in class and my, I went to my professor and we'd had a, a day long study on the idea of free will and predestination and all this, that and the other and those big theological terms and I went up to my professor afterwards and he looked and I said, well, in my opinion, and Dr. Foster looked at me with his attitude and he goes, mm, I could care less about your attitude, about your opinion. I took a step back and I said, I paid good money for this class. You're going to hear my opinion. I didn't say that out loud, but that's what I was thinking. You know, I'm like, seriously, dude, you don't care? And he goes, Charles, he said, I'm not trying to be rude, but your opinion doesn't matter much. What matters is what the Word of God actually said. And see, we have a church that's full of people's opinions. And what we need is churches full of thus saith the Lord. Not adding our own things to it, but just saying, God, what do you say? See, the Pharisees, through the years, had had their own tradition. They had, if you will, we have what's called a Baptist catechism, which defines what the Baptist doctrine is. We have a Catholic catechism, which defines what the Catholic Church believes. And we have the Methodian catechism, which defines what the Methodists have to say. And we have all, really what we need is a B-I-B-L-E. That's really what we need. Amen? Amen. And, and if we get by that, then we start realizing, you know what God has already said? If you're going through and you're hungry, you're not working by going and just taking an ear off the corn. You're not doing anything wrong by using a different translation than the King James Version. You're not doing anything wrong by not wearing a suit. You're not doing anything wrong by not shaving one day. You're not doing anything wrong by just coming to church as you are and worshiping God as you are and praising God and how you can. Whether that's raising your hands or keeping your hands down, whether that's clapping or not clapping, whether that's saying praise God, hallelujah, or being quiet. You're just doing what you feel God has called you to do. And believe it or not, that's all worship. If you go to the psalmist, some of the worship is quiet. Be still and know that I'm God. Some of the worship is having tambourines and, and, making, and playing the, 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 the stringed instruments. Some of it's raising hands and some of it's clapping. And we have this idea that we want to try to put people in the mold that, that we think they should be in when really we just need to go to God and say, God, what do you see? Because they did as many in the church are guilty of today, adding personal interpretation rather than just letting the Word of God speak for itself. In this, they created heartache and unavoidable, unavoidable guilt for all. When we start adding do's and don'ts, all we're doing is producing guilt, not freedom and worship. The Pharisees had missed the point of Christ. See, the Lord was and is more concerned about the welfare of people more than He is about obedience to rituals. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 7 it says, But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. See, God's more concerned about people receiving His grace 
than fitting into the mold of whatever the church thinks that mold is. Because it's about the Word of God and thus saith the Lord. Our focus, we need to understand, reveals our heart. The Pharisees' heart was one of callousness and condemnation. They just wanted to condemn and judge those who were different and oppose their idea rather than just what God said. And in fact, the Pharisee's heart was one of callousness and condemnation. In Luke chapter 11 and verse 42, Jesus speaking says, Woe unto you Pharisees! For ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God, and these ought ye to have done and not leave the other undone. See, they were good about the rituals, they were good about the tithes, they were good about the offerings, but they had forgot, they had forgot about the love of God. They were good with judging and telling people when they're wrong, but they done forgot about God's grace. And see, not only do we need to have a change in focus, but we also find a gift of freedom, not enforcement of oppression. A gift of freedom, not, op- not a force, uh, enforcement of oppression. In verse 27 and 28 it says... And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Last week he was dealing with him being Lord over the law and, and, and bringing something new in, and the old, out with the old and in with the new, and a better covenant. This week he's dealing with the fact that he is Lord over the Sabbath as well. That he's God, that he's the King. God intended for the Sabbath to be a sign of freedom for God's people, a reminder of His love towards them. We have to realize the Sabbath was created for a sign, according to the book of Ezekiel, that has always been a perpetual sign to the Jew of God's rest. It was for them. But rather than doing that, the Pharisees, though the, through their addition and rugged interpretation of the law, had brought oppression rather than freedom. They'd oppressed people with more and more law, with more and more guilt, with more and more shame, with more and more do's and don'ts. Luke eleven forty six, he says, Woe unto you also, you lawyers, for you laid men with burdens grievous to be born, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. In other words, the Pharisees weren't practicing what they teach. They could go about telling people how wrong they were, and how bad they were, and how they shouldn't do this, and how they shouldn't do that, but when, they, when it comes to self-examination, they left that alone. Because they were the scribes and the Pharisees, and they were just they were better than everybody else. How many of us in the church today have been guilty of that? Or know somebody else that we can point out all the wrongs about somebody next to us and how they've wronged us and how they've been bad to us and how they've done this, but we, when it comes to me, no, I've not done anything wrong to anybody. And so we make up these excuses and the reality, I haven't met anybody that's not hurt somebody at some point in life. I've not met somebody that hasn't messed up that it hasn't sinned, that it hasn't transgressed in one way or the other. Well, preacher, I'm not, my sin isn't as bad as this person. Well, according to the Word of God, the Word of God says if you failed in one area, you failed in all areas. Amen. And so therefore, we're all guilty of the sin, period. That's the end of it. From me to anybody else. And there's only one thing that covers that sin, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. At the cross, we're all equal, Amen. Nobody is any better than the other person. Nobody should have any more burden than another person. We should all come to Jesus Christ and all be striving for one thing, and that is to be better in our walk and our relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's not up to man to determine how and when the Sabbath is to be served. That is under the control of the Lord. We must follow the Scriptures and worship the Lord through the Sabbath and all under the watchful eye of the Lord and not man. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. That Sabbath was to give man rest. And for those that don't understand, we don't come and worship on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was, is on Saturday. It always has been on Saturday. So preacher, why do we come on Sunday? Why do we come the first day of the week? A couple of reasons. One, Jesus Christ rose on the first day of the week. 
And so we come and worship on the day of the Lord because that's the day He rose. It was Sunday morning. We also do it because there's scriptural precedent. Because Jesus told Jesus and his disciples, and Paul told the Paul told the told the church to come on the first day of the week to break bread, to collect tithes and offerings, and to worship God. So we come on Sunday as a New Testament church because that's what God told us to do. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't shouldn't keep this day holy, because we're to keep Sunday holy. We are to worship God. We are to take time out for God. This is the Lord's day. And we have all these ideas, but it's what God's Word says. How about a test of truth? In chapter 3 and verse 1 and 2 it says, He entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. There's some tests of truth here. The first truth is, is ministry begins with the castaways. <clears throat> ministry doesn't begin with the elitist. Ministry begins with those that everybody else has shunned and threw away. It says there was a man which had a withered hand. The idea there is he probably wouldn't even, he wouldn't even be allowed in to the, to the temple court, to the holy place. He, he would have to stay out temple. He couldn't go in the temple proper. He would just have to stay out where the Gentiles were, because he couldn't go out there where he couldn't go to worship God because he had something maimed on his hand. And the only ones he could go in, if there was no maiming, there was none of that. Everybody else had threw him away and cast him out because of his hand, and yet God was still reaching out to him to heal him. See, that's what the Lord's about. It's about reaching out to everyone else that nobody else wants. And He says, come to Me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and what? I'll give you rest. Because He's there to heal everybody. People are watching. They watched Jesus. They wanted to accuse Him of something, but they were watching Him. May I declare to you today, if you're a child of God, people are watching you too. They want to know what you're doing. They want to see how you react in a certain situation. And many of them are doing the same thing that the Pharisees are doing. They're waiting for you to mess up so they can look at you and say, I told you so, preacher. I knew you were no different than everybody else down there. I told you your church was this way. I told you some members were this way. I told you you da-da-da-da-da. And they come up. I didn't know why, because I've heard that before. You're no different than me, preacher. And that was my fellow church member too, by the way. I looked at him and said, I've been telling you that for quite some time. I'm like, you finally got it. <laughs> I mean, you know, they didn't like my response, but that was my response, okay? I was carnal. Some of y'all got this look. I can't believe preacher said that. Hang on. If, you, if I've not shocked you by something I've said, it's going to come. If Mary was here at this point, this has been when she'd be like, but she's not here, so I can tell you what I want to if either one of you repeat that, I will. <laughs> but we have this idea. People are watching. They're watching. And they're either going to see you fail or they're going to see you honor God. And most of them want to see you fail. They don't want to see you grow in God. They don't want to see you mature in the Lord. But you know what? Upset them. Grow in the Lord. Mature in the Lord. Pray in the Lord. And just grow and be what God has called you to be. And people are going to test to see how far you'll take your faith to just see just how genuine your ministry really is. They're going to test you. They're going to say, you know what? That preacher's got a good game, but I wonder if he can... Act. He's got a good talk, but I wonder if his game matches it. He talks about this and he talks about that, but I wonder what he's like when nobody else is around. I wonder what he's going to be like if everybody turned their back on him and didn't support him anymore. It says whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. In the Pharisees' testing, they revealed just how perverse their religion really was. Because they were more concerned about rituals than they were the well-being of this man. Uh, the Holman Christian Sanders says, that, uh, uh, Bible commentary on Mark says, It is sad when we use our religion as a weapon 
and ignore human need just to prove a point. How many times have you seen people beat other people down with the Scripture? Just to prove a point. Just to prove that they know more Bible than that person does. Just to get a point across. They'll say, they'll look, bah, 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 Knowing all the time that their life doesn't have anything to do with what they're talking about. That they need to be beating themselves down and doing a self-examination. The worst thing that any of us could ever do is take the Word of God and just start beating people with it. You know, the only thing a lost person understands scripturally is for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son in the world to condemn it, but the world through Him might be saved. That's what it's about. A lost person doesn't need to hear the religious do's and don'ts. What they need to hear is thus saith the Lord. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. That puts a gap between you and God. Just like it put a gap between me and God. But there's something that bridges that gap and that's called the cross of Calvary. And Jesus Christ bled and died on that cross and was rose three days later. So that just like me, I walked across that cross and gave my life to Jesus and I found a relationship with God, you can walk with me too. That's what it's about. Seeing with compassion in verse 3, and he said unto the man which had withered hands, stand forth. We must accept people where they are if we're ever going to lead them where they need to be. We need to accept them where they are if we're ever going to lead them to where they need to be. Jesus looked at that man right where he was at and said, stand up, son. Stand up. Stand up, sir. We must understand that accepting people where they are to lead them where they, where they ought to be does not come without conflict and strife. Oh, this was going to bring conflict and strife. If God healed that man, if Jesus healed that man, it was going to cause problems. There are times when you're doing exactly what you need to be doing and you're living the life that God has told you to do and you're fulfilling the ministry that God has called you to, it's going to have difficulties. It's going to have complications. And how do I know that? Because they killed Jesus. And if they kill Jesus, you know they're going to kill you. We need to realize that ministry is hard. Ministry is dirty. Ministry is problematic. And ministry is a fight. There is nothing easy about being obedient to the commands and the Word of God. I have been dirt, I have been hit in the ministry. I have hit, spiritually hit. I have had to get dirty with people. I've had to deal with problems. I've had to deal with fights. I've had to deal with issues. I've had to be... Well, preacher, I just don't agree with you. You don't have to agree with me. You do have to agree with the Word of God, and that's what I'm saying. No, preacher, show me where I'm wrong. They couldn't say anything. And I said, I'm showing you what the Word says. If I'm wrong, show me I'm wrong. Because it's not about us. It's about Him. Amen? That's what it's about. Christ calls us to the carpet. And He was calling that man to the carpet when He said, stand forth. There's three reasons He calls that man to stand forth. One, he had to admit his need. He had to admit that he needed healing. He was further authenticating the message and miracle of Christ because he was fixing to do it in front of everybody. This change wasn't going to be private. It was going to be public. And he wanted the Pharisees to see the human need takes precedence over rituals. Because God cared about the spiritual well-being of others more than He is at do and don'ts. Christ wanted the Pharisees and us to see people through His eyes, eyes of compassion. Verse 4, we find a question of will and heart. And He said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? But they held their peace. 
Christ drives home the condition of the heart to the Pharisees. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to evil? The question brought to the surface the heart of the Pharisees. It's a question that brings the condition of our heart to the surface. They were willing to stand in a state of sin and have it disguised as religion. How many of us are doing that today? We're living in sin and disguising it with religion. We're living with a rebellious heart and a calloused heart and trying to hide behind the cross. When the reality of it is it's the cross that brings everything to light. On the surface, they were following the law of their own religion. And deeper than the surface, they were, they were sinning by refusing to help. They knew it was better to do good rather than evil, and yet they were committing to the greatest evil by refusing to show the grace of God. And as James state, for him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. The heart of the Pharisees was beyond repentance, but they held their peace. In their silence, they claimed guilt. In their silence, they said, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. Finally, in verse 5 and 6, righteous indignation and a refusal to repent. And when he looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and, be stre and he stretched it out. And his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees sent forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. We find first righteous indignation, the Lord's anger. And when he looked around them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of heart. Christ was angered over the callous heart of the Pharisees just as he is angled over the calloused heart of the religious person today. Because they know all the answers. They all know all the scriptures and the quotes. They got the list of do's and don'ts memorized. And yet they never had a relationship. And the Pharisees were willing to join with those they found nothing in common with if it meant they could destroy Jesus in his ministry. They went to the Herodians. People they didn't even like in the first place. And they said, but you know what? We got a common. We got a common enemy and his name is Jesus. So why don't we get together and do something about it? You know, I've learned it's kind of ironic that the religious leaders of the day were plotting the greatest evil against the greatest love ever shown. Because Christ surely was a suffering servant. Now, I've learned through the years that often in times, bullies, when they see somebody else being bullied, will just jump in on there with them. And I've seen that in church. And to be honest with you, I've been a recipient of it. I've seen people come up with crazy stuff just for they could be part of the show. Just for they could be part of it. Rather than saying, this is wrong. Rather than sharing the love of Jesus, they stood and hid behind their religion. I wonder how many of us this morning need to stop hiding behind religion and walk the aisle and say, I need a relationship. I wonder how many of us this morning need to stop looking at others and judging them for what they're doing wrong and take a long look in the mirror and see what we're doing wrong, what I'm doing wrong. Where are you at this morning? Do you know Jesus? Do you have a prayer concern, a prayer need, maybe a change that needs to take place? That's what this altar's for. But as the musicians come, you, you come. You come. Everybody stand, please. Every head bow.